apologize if you if you came to see uh the episode never been chromist i apologize there's been a change so um you can get a refund okay good friday morning everyone uh so glad you're here on this journey of learning with me this morning Welcome to the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist. My name is Tim. I will be your host this morning in an episode. Somebody pointed out I originally titled Never Been Chromist, um, but that was kind of my minutes before the submission deadline title. And now with my author's license, uh, I've made a change that also made it easier to edit and Photoshop. Uh, we are talking about chromists this week, and uh, I've actually had chromists on my list of episode possibilities. Uh, our our list of episode possibilities, the research team for 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 quite some time now, several years, um, and it it this was one that was just kind of there and really hard to bring forward um, because there's so many other fun topics, you know, like just about everything else, and it kind of felt like you're passing over a a pizza for a slice of plain toast. Um, so I I kind of I kept kept kicking this chromist can down the road and then finally said all right we're gonna do it um because the chromists make up an entire kingdom of life and there are only seven kingdoms uh it's at least as and probably more diverse than the animal kingdom we really don't know how diverse all these kingdoms are it's it's a pretty big estimate but at least as diverse as the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom probably more and i know absolutely nothing about this kingdom or, or so i thought i We'll find out that we all knew a little bit, um, but we didn't associate them with this. And let, for example, who knew that the giant kelp beds that support those adorable otters are chromists? So uh, that fact put a little bit of put a put a pat of butter on that plain toast, and then I was rolling. And I just I'm just like I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and bring you episode 23 of season four of the Backyard Naturalist with. A, a new title for the release in this country, Children of the Chromist. Right after, a quick thank you from our sponsor, which is you all. Thank you to all of you for watching and uh, learning with me today, whether live or recorded. And thank you to our Backyard Naturalist subscribers for your role in keeping this community going every Friday morning. Okay, so what is a chromist? Um, to start with, all of these things you see are chromists. So starting with the photo on the upper left, that is a single-celled marine phytoplankton surrounded by calcium carbonate scales. If we call something phytoplankton, it means it's suspended in water, unable to swim against the current uh, on its own accord, and it's an autotroph, meaning it produces its own food. That's the phyto part of the phytoplankton, a primary producing, producer, uh, so that that little Chex mix blob on the upper left is Emiliana Huxleyi, and it's a chromist. The photo on the upper right is a mix of diatoms living in between crystals of sea ice in Antarctica. Also phytoplankton, marine algae, but this time surrounded by silica, and also a chromist. The photo in the middle right is a water mold, which despite the name is not a mold, it's not a fungus, it's a fungus-like oomycete. And this one was isolated from a small stream around a rice field in Japan, also a chromist. On the bottom right, we have a type of algae called a cryptophyceae. Uh, this one also called Rhodomonas salina, collected off the coast of France, also a chromist. And then finally, on the lower left, we have giant kelp, the world's largest marine quote unquote plant. It's not a plant, it is a chromist. So this this touches a bit on the diversity of chromis from the microscopic to the giant. Uh, and so, yeah, these things are chromists, which keeps that question front and center, what is a chromist? And I will start by saying the story I'm telling today is rooted entirely in Western science and, uh, and its seemingly innate desire to classify everything into neat little boxes. Uh, many other cultures and ways of learning with traditional knowledge uh, have a very different outlook and view on nature and nature classification um, in ways that are much more intuitive, in my opinion. But uh, in the Western world, we have our own way of classifying life, which has evolved much over time. Uh, in the episode, 
it was either the archaea or protozoa. I, I kind of go through this this cra crazy journey of of our desire to put everything neat in boxes and and the evolution of taxonomy that really starts with Linnaeus, who started very simply. He said, "There's two kingdoms. Anything alive was either an animal or a vegetable. Not an animal or plant. An animal or a vegetable, uh, as it's written." And again, there is no botanical term for vegetable. Pretty much anything that is a plant is made up of vegetative matter. So all the stuff is vegetables, animals and vegetables, uh, even fruits are vegetables. So then from here on the journey of taxonomy evolves through many iterations. There's a lot of uh, fights that break out over what's supposed to go where. Uh, we add kingdoms when we find out that something is not like the other. We add empires, we add domains, like an imperial force when something is really different. And then sometimes you subtract kingdoms uh, or domains until you come to what, again, this branch of this branch of knowledge, this Western science uh, has the most recent iteration, which is by Thomas Cavalier Smith, which was revised most recently in 2015, just eight years ago. And that divides all living things into two super kingdoms or empires and seven kingdoms. So all life we know of are divided into seven kingdoms. Um, we'll do a quick overview of what these major groupings are because that's kind of central to, to an understanding of uh, Chromis. The, there's two super kingdoms of life. There's the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes. So starting with prokaryotes, they're single-celled organisms that lack a nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles. In other words, they have that exterior membrane, uh, but everything else is just floating around freely inside. There's no, there's no separation inside that cell. Things are just kind of floating around, no boundaries. And it's the prokaryotes are divided into our first two kingdoms, both of which have their own backyard naturalist episode. We have the bacteria and the archaea very similar, um, both extremely ancient, both extremely diverse, and both extremely important to life, extremely important to your life. Um, and beyond that, the differences between these two kingdoms is pretty boring. The, the cell walls of bacteria contain peptidoglycan and the archaea don't. The lipid linkage in bacterial cell walls is ester-based, you, you all knew this, and the lipid link linkage in our kale cells is ether-based. Um, so please, like me, go ahead and ignore that fact immediately. But it is fun to understand that these are two very diverse, very important kingdoms to life on Earth. Um, and you can find out more in two episodes, The Way Bacteria and Raiders of the Lost Archaea. And then moving on, the other super kingdom is the eukaryotes. So this is they all share the characteristics of having a membrane-bound cell nucleus, membrane-bound nucleus in the cell. And they often have other membrane-bound organelles. So I said, they. this is we, this is our kingdom, this is our domain. Uh, and this domain includes the other five kingdoms, um, everything from unicellular algae to multicellular Norway rats. Very briefly, these kingdoms are the animal kingdom, not super diverse in terms of species, you know, relative to the other kingdoms. Uh, but this is obviously the one that we're most familiar with. Uh, mammals to birds, starfish to spiders, crabs to octopuses, sea squirts to sea slugs, mussels to bryozoans, sponges to stink bugs, jellyfish to not jellyfish. Uh, these are all animals. And I, again, it kind of looks extremely diverse. Uh, especially when you realize that horseshoe worms, spiny-headed worms, and flat worms are as different to each other as a tiger is to a blue jay. Uh, and the animal kingdom is has maybe one of my favorite uh, all-time backyard naturalist stars, the tardigrade, also featured in a couple of episodes, uh, including one on moss. We estimate there are about 7 million animal species in the world. We've described one and a half million of them and one million of those one and a half million are insects. Um, but as a fellow mammal, we like to study this group a lot. And um, one thing that you see right away with this, 
Western approach to taxonomy is that we can't fit everything neatly into boxes, no matter how hard we try. I think Robin gave me a book called Naming Nature that that looks at our desire to do that. And you know, when you do that, you find out that there is really no such thing as a fish. Uh, we can talk about that later. But the best we can do is is to say that through this, we can say that animals are multicellular, eukaryotic again. Um, and then after that, we can say for the most part, animals share the following traits, which then means there's always exceptions. Um, they grow from a hollow sphere of cells called the blastula and development and embryonic development. They consume organic material, they breathe oxygen, they are able to move and they reproduce sexually, except for those exceptions to the rules. So it, even animals is not a neatly defined uh, group. But then the group we're next, probably next most familiar with, are the plants. And they also possess a diversity that we can see and feel and touch. Uh, from roses to wellwitchia, look that one up, to sundew, liverworts, raspberries, asters, black cherries, ginkgo balboa, cycads, willows, orchids, mosses, ferns, firs. Uh, this is a group that generally shares the following traits. Even the plants don't fit in a neat box. Uh, they generally share the following traits. Um, they're multicellular, primary producers. Uh, they carry out photosynthesis. They have a cellulose-based cell wall. And like the animals, they're multicellular. And we've described far fewer plants than animals. Uh, about one-fifth of the number of plants are described as we have for animals, about 320,000. And then the next most familiar kingdom to us is probably the fungi, um, a group that contains molds and yeasts, uh, chytrids and conidiophores, basidiomycetes, asomycetes. Like animals, fungi are heterotrophs. They don't make their own food. Um, they don't photosynthesize. Like plants, they're usually rooted in the soil or a substrate cell wall, but it's a, a, a chitin-based cell wall. And they reproduce through, reproduce through spores. And like plants, many of them are delicious or deadly. So the mushrooms have their own kingdom because they're different enough from plants and animals. And then we move on to maybe the second least familiar kingdom, the protozoans, which also have their own episode. Now we're talking single-celled organisms that can move around and eat other things like animals. Uh, they don't have a cell wall. And so for a long time, they were thought of as just that, as single-celled animals. So multicellular animals were called animals. Single-celled animals were called protozoa. And in fact, the name protozoa means first animal. But then all those people in charge of classifying the system decided for taxonomic and phylogenetic and probably for ego-based reasons uh, to move things around. They they took out the single-celled animals, put them in their own kingdom. Uh, again, it's fuzzy, but really for all intents and purposes, you can say the main differences between animals and protozoa has to do with them being single-celled or multicellular. Um, again, it's not a nice definition, but that, that's the easy way to think of it. So that's six of the seven kingdoms. And then finally, we move on to this entire kingdom that I knew nothing about, which is the chromists. Um, the kingdom Chromista, and probably the easiest way to wrap your head around this is that if if protozoa are considered the OG animals, they're considered the, the first animals, you can kind of take that and call the Chromists the first plants. Um, in, in fact, in earlier classifications, we had a group called the Protists. That's what I learned about. The Protists had the animal-like protozoa and the plant-like protists, which are called now chromists. Um, so that complexity becomes a little more digestible when you just think of, okay, the protozoans are tiny animals, the chromists are kind of like tiny plants, um, with, of course, that major exception in the algae, um, in the kelp. Uh, and so then, like the other kingdoms, you can start to list what are the primary characteristics of chromists, with the exception. So first, most of them are unicellular. Um, if they're not unicellular, well, it some of them are also unicellular, but living in colonies. 
And so if they're in colonies, they're still individual organisms, but they start to specialize into playing certain roles, uh, having different tasks. It's kind of like a cooperative of individuals working together for a common good, um, but specializing in roles. And then <clears throat> uh, another thing to note about uh, the chromis is, as you can see in the slide, is that there's this huge diversity in appearance. Um, and, and that's not so much the case for the protozoa. If you look at the protozoa, the single-celled animals, they all have a very similar uh, body shape type. Uh, the plants, the, the I'm sorry, the chromists have a much more diverse uh, look. And um, then of course, the our exception to the rule is the kelp. Kelp are really the, they gotta put them somewhere um, and and so they're they're grouped with the chromis, really odd person out um, in in the unicellular chromis world. Even though kelp look like a plant, they aren't, and even though they don't look like other chromists, they are. So this is the only group of multicellular chromists. They do not have roots. They have um, something called a hold fast, which resemble roots, and their sole purpose is to anchor the kelp to hold it to the ground. Um, they don't absorb nutrients, they don't have mycorrhizal relationships, they don't perform any of those functions that a plant root does. Their sole function is, is to keep that kelp bound to the substrate so it doesn't float away. Put a lot of kelp together and it looks like a forest of plants. Um, so it's called a, a kelp forest. It's not plants, it's kelp, it's chromist, a chromist forest. And it harbors a diverse community of other organisms Many different species, including humans throughout history, have relied on the presence of kelp forests. In fact, some species are so tied to kelp forests, they, they derive their namesake from them, like the northern kelp crab and its cousin, the graceful kelp crab, uh, the kelp fish, the kelp goose, and the kelp pigeon. Kelp do possess these nematocysts, which make for some great photographs, but are essentially little gas-filled balls that bring the kelp closer to the surface of the water where they can reach sunlight. It's their way of getting up to the, if it were a land forest, getting up to the canopy sunlight. In this case, it helps the plant get closer to the surface where they can reach the sunlight so they can undergo photosynthesis to make food. Um, kelp aren't plants, so they don't have leaves. Instead, they have leaf-like structures known as blades where photosynthesis occurs. The blades originate from stem-like structure called site type stipes, excuse me. Um, the giant kelp can grow more than two feet in a day and individuals can reach a hundred feet long, taking their name very seriously, the giant kelp. And um, so then we move on. Another characteristic of the chromis is that most of them are autotrophic, meaning they make their own food from sunlight by photosynthesis, from chloroplasts, just like plants. So they are primary producers, just like most plants. And when you come up to your pool that doesn't have all those nasty chemicals and the water is turned a bit green, um, you can either look at it in disgust and say, ah, or you can say, wow, look at all this, this, uh, this pool full of chromis. This is so cool. Um, it's not harmful, uh, apart from maybe making the edges of the pool a bit more sleep, slippery. Um, I wouldn't drink it. Uh, a third characteristic of chromis that make them similar to plants is they have a cell wall. A uh, fourth characteristic of chromis is that most of them live in water or at least a very wet environment. So here's a type of chromis called a water mold. It's not a mold. Um, it's not a fungus, but it functions like one. Um, so if you have an aquarium and a fish dies, you don't get it out right away. You might notice that it starts to look a little fuzzy. Um, it looks like it's getting moldy, but um, essentially it's just this water mold, this chromis that's growing on the dead fish, not a fungus. Um, so it's something to admire before flushing the deceased down the toilet or, or burying it or however uh, one handles the situation. Another characteristic, of a, another characteristic of chromis is that they alternate reproducing sexually and asexually. This is called alternation of generations between haploids and diploids. You essentially start with cell division, producing two different gametes. Uh, they're not male and female. They're um, 
they're plus and minus, I think, um, that reproduce sexually. They have gene exchange through conjugation, produce a spore, which is kind of the equivalent of an egg, which then grows and produces uh, genetically different spores, uh, which divides into gametes, and then the cycle continues. So this is not unique to chromis. This is a the reproductive cycle, uh, many fungi and plants, fungi, plants. Um, so again, like with those other groups, you just have this group of organisms that share most of this stuff. Um, but again, at, at the end of the day, if you just kind of think, okay, the, the chromis are, other than the kelp, are really just those tiny plants or plant-like organisms. Okay, so then I also advertised that I would convince you that chromists are cool. Um, and so I'm going to try to do that if you are, unless you already think they're amazing. Um, so uh, let's take a look at some, some examples. One, one pattern that exists in tropical forests on land is that you, you know, you, it's green. Most of the leaves in most forests are green. They're green because green is the only color that they don't use in photosynthesis. So they reflect it. They don't want it. Get away from me, green. Then that's why we see the leaves as green. And then what they do use for photosynthesis are mainly the blues and the reds. Those are the most efficient uh, producers of sugars in photosynthesis. But if you if you visit a forest, particularly a tropical forest, um, where you have areas where light gets very low, you'll notice that a lot of those low growing plants with, with very little light will have hints of red which makes them attractive as houseplants, but they show up as red mainly because sometimes red is a signal uh, it, to like a pollinator, but, but in this case, they're red because these plants have evolved a pigment that can photosynthesize that green wavelength that none of the other plants are photosynthesizing. So uh, they're not getting much of the reds and blues that they need if they're using the chlorophyll A. So they've adapted to, um, a, a slightly less efficient type of chlorophyll that does work with the green lights. So um, not as efficient, but in, in that environment, it's a, it's a smart move because you're not getting much of the light because all the other plants are kind of hogging it. Um, so that pattern that you see on land, you also see in water with the chromis. So chromis at the surface tend to be green, uh, like like some kelp, like that pool scum, for the same reason. Um, they are absorbing the other lights and reflecting the greens. But then if, if you go, there are some chromis that live deeper. Um, and uh, some of the kelp might show up as red for precisely the same reason as those houseplants. They're photosynthesizing um, the blues and some of the leftover greens and reflecting the red. So that's a, a pretty cool pattern that holds with the chromists. Uh, there are other famous, or actually, I think I'm going to, I'm moving into some infamous chromists, uh, another red infamous chromist. So you, you may have heard of red tides. Uh, these are caused by a chromist, a type of dinoflagellate called fire algae. Uh, they're naturally pigmented in orange red color. Um, and then uh, in these blooms, they unfortunately also release toxins into the water that can be harmful to um, wildlife and humans. Uh, continuing down the road of infamy, you've probably heard of the Irish potato famine that is uh, chronicled in the potato episode, also caused by an infamous chromist, um, the potato blight, which coupled with, with the social issues at the time led to the death of, of a million people and the displacement of two million more. Um, if you have a kitty cat, you may have heard of Taxoplasmosis, the, the kitty litter critter, um, uh, also a chromist. And there's a, a chromist called plasmodium that is the vector of a disease that you've likely heard about called malaria. And so um, whether you know them as chromists or not, uh, there are um, a, a whole list of chromists that you are probably familiar with. Um, but, uh, you know, these are the, the infamous ones, and I can't think of a, a better way to, to, to wrap up 
a talk on why chromos are cool than to talk about um, one of nature's spectacular shows. So you may have heard of bioluminous analogy before. You can visit bioluminescent bays in places like Puerto Rico, uh, and bioluminescent algae are a type of chromist that, when disturbed, will emit visible light and produce spectacular images, um, particularly at night when you're out in a boat kayaking. It's the same type of luminescence that you get from land fungi, from some insects. It's an incredibly efficient light source, producing almost no heat. Uh, way, way, way more efficient than anything, you know, comes from photoluminescence. Um, it, it, and it turns on and off very quickly, which uh, then leads us to, to closing with not one moment of Zen, but we've got two moments of Zen for you. So we'll start with the first one here. Okay, and then I'm going to move um, to our second uh, moment of Zen here. So I did my best to uh, hopefully convince you that chromists are indeed cool, or at the very least to spread the word that this kingdom exists. Um, all of these kingdoms, like I said at the beginning, are fluid, especially when you get to this level. Um, when you talk about protozoa and chromists and even plants, uh, and you look at something like algae, um, algae move around. Some, you know, some consider them plants. Some consider them. Uh, still call them protists. Um, and, you know, there's some classifications that, you know, depending on the type of chlorophyll, some algae are going to be uh, chromists and some are going to be chroma, uh, plants. So it's pretty maddening. And I encourage you not to try to keep up on it, because really, at the end of the day, it's just it just like, um, what's the point? Uh, if you can really enjoy you know them for what they are and that's also a, an encouragement to look at 
at, at, at these things from a non-Western lens, read, read Robin Wall Kilmer, um, look at some of the other uh, ways of looking at the world in ecological knowledge. And at the end of the day, none of that really matters, especially um, when you can see a photo of one of the most adorable animals in the world snuggled up in a bed of one of the most adorable chromists in the world. So thank you for joining me today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen.